Hello, everybody. My name is Kate Russell, technology reporter, author and professional ferret mom. Uh, but today it's my pleasure to introduce you to this session in Mabel, Fantastic Books, massive autumn book launch event. And today we're looking at the genre of showbiz memoirs. Maybe you'll have a showbiz memoir one day. What do you think? I think so. In this session, you're going to be hearing from Mark Millicent reading from Fizzy Days and Plastic Monkeys. Uh, you are also going to be finding out more about Simon Fisher Becker's book series, uh, My Dalek Has a Puncture, My Dalek Has Another Puncture, and Let Zygons Be Zygons. And Colin Spall will be reading from Colin Who? Now, unless it's my memoir, it's going to be hard to link ferrets to people's memoirs, but... Mark Millicent has managed to come up with a tenuous link. Uh, author of the memoir Fizzy Days and Plastic Monkeys, hello you, <laughs> I've got a ferret coming to investigate, uh, notes that he himself demonstrated some clearly ferret-like traits in his younger days when he and his friends made a hobby of larceny and pilfering using their speed and agility to escape retribution. Um, it does sound exactly like a ferret, and personally, I can't wait to hear it. Are we sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Showbiz Memoirs Spotlight I never deliberately targeted showbiz memoirs as something for fantastic books to take, but these things grow organically and we've accumulated a good collection over the years. I first met Simon Fisher Becker, Doctor Who's Dorian Maldivar, many years ago and have now published his full trilogy, My Dalek Has a Puncture, my Dalek has another puncture, and let Zygons be Zygons. Colin Spall followed. He's one of those actors whose name might not be immediately familiar, but who you will, you will have seen on the big screen, the small screen, or on stage. There are, there are a few areas of TV, film, or theatre that he hasn't dabbled in. He got his first starring role as a child in the BBC's adaptation of Great Expectations. His autobiography, Colin Who, takes us very entertainingly through his long career. Along the way, I met Alan Wakeman, prolific writer and active campaigner, and was delighted to be offered what was to be his first autobiographical work, Fragments of Joy and Sorrow, Memoirs of a Reluctant Revolutionary. Sadly, Alan died before completing the next volume. He was a force to be reckoned with in several areas. His work revolutionised language teaching in the 1970s. He was writing about a vegan lifestyle long before most people knew what the word meant, and he was a tireless campaigner for LGBTQ rights. We're featuring a short reading from Alan's work in this spotlight, and also short pieces from Colin and Simon. But we're going to focus on our most recent acquisition to the showbiz memoir stable. This is Mark Millicent, known in the business as Mill, who has written his extraordinary story in his book Fizzy Days and Plastic Monkeys from Crew to Malibu. Mill is a storyboard artist, a commercial illustrator and short filmmaker. You might not know his name, but you will have seen his illustrations, which are known around the world. He's worked for production houses, large and small, from Disney to Warner Brothers. His work has been recognised by several awards over the years. There now follow some short extracts from Simon Fisher Becker's, Colin Spall's and Alan Wakeman's work. Following this, Dawn Snyder, Director of Education for the Art Directors Guild, will introduce Mill Millicent, talking to fellow storyboard artist Frankie Smith about their work, his career, and his memoir, Fizzy Days and Plastic Monkeys from Crew to Malibu. Enjoy! <laughs> Hi, um, I'm going to read you... Um, one of Alan Wakeman's Fragments of Joy and Sorrow, Memoir of a Reluctant Revolutionary. Now, that's the name of um, Alan's, Alan's autobiography. I, I demanded it have a name, and that's what he came up with. And uh, I, I, I love it. And I think he was a wonderful man who we sadly lost in 2015, mid-August 2015. I remember getting the call from David, his friend, and um, yeah, it was a, it it was a real shock. I was, I was speaking to Alan just the, just the evening previous about various bits, as we often did. We spoke for hours on the phone. Whenever I was in London, I would meet up with Alan for, uh, for lunch and things. And although we only knew each other for eighteen months, it was quite an intense friendship. Um, yet, 
yet a, a, a relaxed and you can kind of feel the growth in friendships like that and it was it was a real shame there's still a part of me that mourns alan um and and the memories we made together and the fact that we won't get to make any more so um so rest well sir rest well this fragment is from when alan um first arrived in ankara in turkey so without further ado and apologies for butchering this alan he was one of the most talented wordsmiths I've met and to to attempt to put as much effort into delivering his words as he did putting them down on paper would be impossible for me uh, but I will I will do my best so apologies in advance uh, for those of you who have heard Alan read this very same fragment before he passed away. Ankara, Turkish Daybook July 1977, aged 41. Help from a fellow passenger. The airport, a madhouse. The customs officer shouts, loses his temper, breaks down, pleads, threatens, draws his gun. But order is not to be wrested from so much fear. Clearly they won't be able to contain us in this arrivals area much longer. I notice a man from my flight investigating an unobtrusive door, which, surprisingly, opens to a busy street with a brief glimpse of bright sunshine. He quietly collects his luggage, carries it to the door, looks quickly round, then walks out, closing the door behind him. He looks Turkish, and no one has noticed anything. I pick up my hold all and do the same. Instant, frenetic chaos. Blinding light, engulfing heat, shouting crowds, hooting cars. A taxi stops and its driver yells at me to get in. I do. I'm, I'm whisked away on a ride that's more an attempt to kill. The heat is all engulfing, yet it's already evening. Tomorrow I must face midday. Aye. Winter, 2012 through 13. 36 years later. I'd been invited to Turkey by Nasif Ulgan, the owner of several language schools that were then using my classroom course English Fast. So that taxi ride through Ankara was not only terrifying, but perplexing. For the name of my course was everywhere I looked. On hoardings, on the sides of buses, and on gigantic banners slung across main thoroughfares. English fast, they shouted, and I found myself wondering if I was famous in that city at least. Nassif had generously invited me to stay with his family, so that evening before dinner I expressed my gratitude for his extensive promotion of my course, and was stunned to hear him admit that the banners were in fact advertisements for his own schools which he'd named after it. The schools are still there, but are now run by his son as Nassif has retired. Another reason for my visit was an invitation by the British Council to lecture on language laboratory techniques to local English teachers. Unfortunately, their representative forgot to alert me to daily power cuts in Ankara at that time, so instead of my usual jokey demonstration of using sound recordings to improve English language teaching, I was obliged to talk about the subject by candlelight. Amazing. Amazing. There are hundreds of these fragments, and there would have been hundreds more. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. And finally, given the rather morbid nature of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of the reason why we're, I'm, I've decided to highlight Alan in, uh, in this section of Mabel, um, I'm going to read a short piece that, he's, um, uh, that, that he, he put together himself in a, in a short collection that he published much earlier, many years ago. It's called Death, and it's from Hamon and Gibben. Hamon and Gibben were walking on the sand. Before them stretched the immensity of the sea, vanishing into the morning mist. When I look at the sea, I think of death, said Hamon, and I'm terrified. Console me if you can. Gibben walked on a few paces in silence and then replied, Two raindrops were falling together towards the ocean. One said to the other, I'm terrified of the ocean. Compared with its vastness, we are insignificant. It will engulf us without even noticing. The other replied, we are the ocean. Rest well, Alan. I hope you enjoyed that and do enjoy the rest of Mabel.
Colin Who is about my life um, in show business. I have been an actor now for 65 years and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I decided to write the book um, uh, uh, really as a bit of an exercise in, in, in my memory. Um, and um, I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, some of the things I've done, some of the things, uh, and some of the people I've met, um, it's, it's, it's been a fantastic journey. And uh, I do hope that whoever reads this gets as much pleasure from it as I did in writing it. Enjoy. Colin who? The weather was vile and an icy blast was running up my left trouser leg, chilling all it found at the end of the tunnel before roaring down my right leg, sending shivers into my toes. Ahead of me stood the ladder I was expected to climb to reach my seat in the commentary box at Gillingham Football Club's ground in Kent. I don't usually have a problem with ladders. Occasionally, when times were hard, I worked as a builder's labourer and hod carrier. But I was a bit younger then. A man of my age should definitely not be expected to climb ladders under any circumstances, let alone in the open air and in weather like this. Yet, here I was, about to climb the one to the next step in my film career, starring as a football commentator in Make Aliens Dance, a short film destined to be shown at major film festivals in the United States. Looking back over my life, I find myself at a bit of a loss as to how it all came about. Time for some detailed reflection. Should I look backwards from today or forwards from the 40s? I've spent most of my life before a TV camera, a film camera, a microphone or footlights. What, though, was the last truly memorable thing I did? Was it as bad as this? In my line of work, you often find yourself being abused, sometimes verbally sometimes physically, and occasionally both, such as when you appear in Catherine Tate's Christmas show on BBC television. In 2015, I played Miss Tate's hapless neighbour, Bernie, who, despite the indignities he suffers at her hands, including being knocked to the ground and sprayed with foam from a fire extinguisher, remains resolutely infatuated with the repulsive Nan character. I shouldn't complain. She managed to humiliate most everyone in the show, even Warwick Davis, who had done nothing to deserve it. An interesting experience, but one which gave me pause for thought. How had I, a South London boy whose family weren't actors or entertainers, come to be watched by millions of people as I endured such treatment? It then occurred to me that I was probably starting at the wrong end. Life is, after all, a story with a beginning, a middle, and, well, let's not get morbid. Simon Fisher-Becker, perhaps better known as the bright blue Dorian Maldivar intergalactic black marketeer, is a natural raconteur who has performed his one-man show to captivated audiences worldwide. It was out of these shows that his autobiographical trilogy was born. Now here are just a few things that the world has had to say about the memoirs of Simon Fisher Becker. On My Dalek Has a Puncture. Kay Lawrence from the UK talking about My Dalek Has a Puncture says simply, gripping, fascinating, enlightening, funny and sad, recommended. An anonymous reviewer on the same book says, a true inspiration, a fantastic read. Simon certainly has been through some of life's worst moments and has come through them. He is a true inspiration for everyone who feels like giving up. He is such a charming man in person and his one-man show is fantastic. A highly recommended read. I wish there were more than five stars to give. This book deserves them all. On My Dalek has another puncture. Brian Jacobson from Cardiff says, What a page turner. Very funny. Sometimes sad, but always entertaining. Above all, it's helped me to think about my own demons and how I can cope with them. Highly recommended. From Jenny Coles from Wellington, New Zealand. What a pick me up. This is such an easy read. A rich, honest, at times disturbing account of life experiences shared with hilarious anecdotes that have me laughing out loud. Having met Simon Fisher Becker, I found him to be a sincere, genuine, kind person. 
My Dalek has another puncture is just a fraction of what the man is about. Do follow his work. From Rick Cross from Alabama, USA. If you only know Simon Fisher Becker as Dorian Maldivar from the 11th Doctor era, you're missing out on a premier essayist, philosopher and wit. Just in time for Christmas, he's issued My Dalek Has Another Puncture, the second of his autobiographical works reflecting on his relationship with Doctor Who, a rocky childhood dodging bullies, and life as a working actor and artist. By turns inspiring, moving and funny as hell, Simon's latest is a perfect holiday prize for that Hoovian in your life. Let Zygons Be Zygons In the third and final book, Let Zygons Be Zygons, Simon follows the track of the first two in charting the ups and downs of a long career with brutal honesty, delving into the dark side of life, as well as the rewards of becoming known to sci-fi fans worldwide as Doctor Who's bright blue Dorian Maldivar. In this final volume, Simon talks about his unexpected role of agony uncle to people who recognise their own experiences in the problems that he talks about openly. Simon is clear, he never gives advice, just makes suggestions, believing in the importance of allowing people to make their own decisions and taking responsibility for their actions. There were those, familiar with the darker corners on which Simon intended to shine a light, who advised him not to write the final book, but he did. Let Zygons Be Zygons is a full and frank account, bearing his trademark honesty. In Simon's own words, writing these books has been cathartic to say the least. Right, well, I'll, I'll jump in then and say, and then this is the book. This is the book uh, that I've put together. Uh, chronicling my journey as a storyboard guy, uh, this was a, a book that was supposed to be to come out with the, this uh, a three million dollar feature, and uh, that uh, after twenty years, it, I, I've stumbled. I've stumbled at the starting blocks and written this. Uh, it's a book that stands alone on its own now that uh, it's not the making of the, the Fizzy Days, which was my film, the short film. I've made a short film, 30 minute short film, that was made uh, to, to raise money for a, for a feature. And uh, that was what I used to, to as the basis for the book. But as, as, as my note taking grew and grew and grew, and it realized that, you know, as a storyboarder, we do, we meet lots of people, we board lots of things, we've got lots of aspirations. There's, there's, uh, it's quite a life if, if, uh, if you chronicle it down. And I thought other well, people would be interested in, you know, what we, you know, what we actually do. That, and I've tried to keep it so as it, that it's available for the layman. It's, it's the word, it's filmmaking and, and all the, you know, all, all the bits and the nitty gritty that go into, go into what we do and how people in the pub, when you mention that, you know, oh, I'm a storyboarder, they don't just let it lie. It's, um, oh, you do, what does that mean? What do you do? Uh, unless you're drinking with a load of storyboard buddies, then they actually <laughs> know what you do. So that's a redundant conversation. But to people that don't, it seems like from the people that have bought the book and reviewed it, it doesn't have to be, uh, for, you know, it's an interesting journey anyway. Well, you know, making a film is like giving birth to, a baby and um right. you know there's a whole lot of stuff goes into making that baby a whole lot of uh, work goes into bringing that baby up um right. to as far as you can um and that's what uh, as i said my basis for the book is a short film yeah. that i'd made a script i'd written uh with the prospective idea of getting it made into a feature and it's what, if all of us, every storyboard guy, every creative has a little project on the side, or they have 10 little projects on the side. They've all, we've all got scripts, we've all got graphic novels, we've all got um, ideas, a set of boards that you think that you're just, or drawings that we kick off and you, you on a rainy day, and we build on them, we go, oh, this is growing, going somewhere, this is, this is going to, and this is my take on how and what the tenacity you need to bring it to people who might be able to do something with what you're doing, be right. it writing or, or storyboarding or, or, or what. That was what it was about. It wasn't 
so much a motorcycle. It was what it was the autonomy of the open road. It's it, it's it's your first love. It's what you it represented once mm. you'd got it. And the the film the the film script that I I I the feature film script is that once it comes full circle, once you have you know we all aspire to this this ideal and once once we have it we find out that maybe that isn't what we were after all the time there's more to life than a, a shiny moped or, or 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 the the pretty girl that couldn't get you know that can't stand you compare it's 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 a very simple tale but it it enabled me to weave in a lot as like a lot of visual situations and a lot of humor that I again the book chronicles the number of close misses I had with people that it came so close you know within London and with it wouldn't be the United States I know a number of people in, in the States wanted can we change the car the, the bikes to cars which spoiled it completely but that was what that's what fizzy is about and that's what the FS1E was a fizzy and it was the best little moped between for three or four years in, in England. It represented glam rock. It represented a time when it was austerity in the England in the early 70s. It was the strikes. It was yeah. the, the bin strikes, the rail strikes, the postal strikes, a bit like now, actually. Um, and that, look at the little colours of it. It's a gold one, a little pink. That sort of was, it was your glam rock. It was your kiss. It was your T-Rex, it was your mud slayed Bay City Rollers. All that was this bike. And that's why I just thought as a buttons to touch for a, a project, the soundtrack in itself is fantastic. And the, 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 the nostalgia that people have for this. These are now, they have cost 200 pounds all those years ago. Grown men like myself now have paid 10,000 10, pounds for these. We are a tool for other people. We, 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 we visualize their vision, um, which as a storyboarder, you 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 know, that's, you, you have a vision. You can then think, oh, wow. I, why don't we cut out the director and make one ourselves, you know, and, and, you know, but it's not about that. There's other people have got the platforms already. That's what I was talking about. It's, a, it's, a, it's getting people on board that if you want to do these, these singularly personal projects or you want to move on from, you want to produce something, you want to produce something creative. Right. Then you've got to inhabit the world of producing stuff for other people. Well, you've got to be a paintbrush for other people rather well, than that yeah, and I'm sorry, but th this brings up another uh, another thought. Um, you just mentioned about these incredibly personal projects, and of which this one this one um, was and still and is. But at some point, and it and you you uh, and I read the transition. It was oh, in the back of my in my head when when I was oh, reading I this. Oh, about um, I, I'm going to keep 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 talking. Keep going, keep going. Sorry. Okay. Keep going. okay. I noticed. I noticed. I was sitting in the dark. I know. I know. I was going to say you know you're, you're yeah, kind yeah. of dark over there. But um, <laughs> so so the, so I understand like um, a lot of a lot of these film projects, a lot of projects start as as a, a very personal piece, in which this one obviously was and is. But at some point in in the book, there is a there is a point here when it starts transitioning to like okay now it needs to become a film it needs to become a project so you you there's a certain percent of where you need a point where you need to set aside some of that 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 you know it's personal to me you need to set some of that aside because of which you're going to need to because it needs to become a film and um has that part has that um did that start becoming, you know, more in the forefront of your thought process when you were, especially when you were, um, you know, sending the script out, trying trying to get that uh, that contract no, very, that you finally much, received? Yeah, yeah, very much so, because, again, there's a set of rules, you know, that's why, I mean, if you create, you've written a script, then that's your, I'm afraid that's your box. The only way that script's going to get made is if you make it. You're not going to go to somebody with, with minimal directing experience or without a bag of further films that you've made and say, hey, would you want to make this? Because no. 
and you don't put exposition, you know, you, you, the direction doesn't go in a script, you know, you, that's the director's part, you know. Right. So immediately you show your amateurishness if you produce a script that, hey, it's got these great songs in it. Hey, it's got this great, you know, it's a, a really groovy angles we're going to do this from here. And, Whoa, let's, do no, it's not, that's, this, those are two animals. There's your own personal script. It's like, uh, it, you know, it's reading like uh, I think Trudy Styler was going on. I was just read an article the other day about uh, Guy Ritchie's um, uh, Snatch, uh, and she said that it was absolutely riddled. It was all over the place. You know, it's but yeah, but whoa, it didn't really matter because he's doing it. He's you know you can't. But as an amateur, you know, somebody bringing it as a newbie bringing a project, and this is for the you know obviously not anybody that's seasoned. Your script has to be professional, and it has to have it has that's it's it has to look professional. It has to have uh, the idea that you're not going to direct it, you know. So all those lovely ideas you've got, you have to put them aside, or you make a short and you showcase how that little film project might look like uh, Napoleon Dynamite. That was the same. They made a little short film. That's what was was there. And like I said to you, I'd read. Errant, not erroneously, but stupidly. <laughs> if you can entertain for thirty minutes, you can entertain for an hour and a half. You can do an you do a ninety. That's that was the that's the bar. But if you're trying to get recognition for your film within film festivals, nobody wants to run a ninety minutes, uh, uh, a thirty minute short film. They want to run ten, two minute film, three minute films. So you 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 then and and again when I. Did mine? It was high definition tapes. It was uh, it was pulling a crew together. Today you can race up and down Hollywood Boulevard with your iPhone 12, 14, whatever. Yeah. You can get some great stuff. And 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 what you know, one thing that we joked about, and it keeps coming up. It was always funny in the book is how many English provincial people know that you need permits to film something. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> You know, despite wearing a, a glow jacket and, and racing around, and, you know, closing the roads off, they know that, you know, you have no right to be there. So uh, uh, that we came across a, a lot. And even um, I did the, the other film uh, I did, uh, another short film, uh, Motorcycle Related, was because um, I, again, I thought I need another film that's just that finished. Hell's Angel. Hell's Angel, yeah. Putting that together, you know, obviously no permits for that. Um, and racing, sorry, let me just turn this up. Um, racing around the Santa Monica Mountains uh, without helmets on, driving Harley Davidsons up and down the snake. You know, knowing for well that if we meet the sheriff or the, the a squad car coming up, that there's going to be trouble, you know, and people will get the, the cam, camera equipment uh, confiscated. But all these <laughs> these elements, you've got to say, nope, want to do it, need to do it, got to do it. Um, never give in, never surrender. 